Of the main three Crisis games, Crisis 2 is perhaps the most divisive as many believe the identity of the original was lost as developer Crytek attempted to make the series more appealing to the general gaming audience. When the first Crisis released, it quickly became a staple in the world of PC gaming and garnered high critical and fan acclaim. Within a year, Crytek followed up on the success of Crisis with a standalone expansion, Crisis Warhead. Warhead didn't shake up the formula too much and was also well received. Three years later in 2011, Crisis would get a full-fledged sequel in the form of Crisis 2. While this title was met with favorable critic reviews, it was clear the gameplay design shifted to fall more in line with the AAA FPS standard, and many vocal fans were not happy about it. Despite all these angry fans and taking ideas from more popular FPS games, Crisis 2 still feels rather unique, albeit less so than the original. After working on three consecutive games set of the tropics, the developers like Crytek were looking for a new challenge. Just like Predator to Predator 2, Crisis 2 traded in a tropical jungle for an urban one. New York City serves as the concrete labyrinth players explore in the second entry, and it accommodates the change in design philosophy from a wide open sandbox to a choreographed one. To compete with the most successful AAA shooters of the era, it's clear the identity of Crisis 2 was modeled after a Hollywood action movie. The game's stuffed to the brim with extravagant set pieces, a larger focus on story, rife with corporate intrigue, color grading ripped right from the latest Hollywood blockbusters, and even a magnificent main theme composed by legend Hans Zimmer. Crisis 2 had evolved into something more palatable for your average FPS gamer who just plays Call of Duty. Although the visuals still looked great, the urban environment was more well-treaded by its peers, and the game ultimately didn't have the same next-generation visual impact the first Crisis brought with it. Crisis 2 did push the graphical envelope in certain regards, such as including an option to run the game using DirectX 11, allowing for massively increased geometric detail via tessellation. Single player wasn't the only mode designed with a new vision in mind. The large format multiplayer of Crisis that was expanded upon in Crisis Wars was completely abandoned here, in favor of multiplayer that was much closer to Call of Duty. The PC servers for Crisis 2 have been offline for almost 10 years now, and the remaster of the game dropped the mode completely. As you might expect, fans are still working to keep multiplayer alive with mods, and you can still search for a match on the Xbox 360 and PS3, but I think you'll have a hard time finding one regardless of the platform. Even though I didn't play the multiplayer in the original Crisis, I did play a decent bit of the mode in Crisis 2 back in the day. Most of my fond memories for the Crisis series are for the original game, but Crisis 2 was the first, and for many years only, entry in the series that I had beaten. Despite being released more recently, my memory of Crisis 2 is hazier than the first game. I do remember enjoying the story mode, however its gameplay and tone changes made it stand out less among the crowd, causing it to be less memorable overall. With the original being such an icon, it can be difficult for many to separate it from Crisis 2 and enjoy the sequel for its own merits. While Crisis and Crisis Warhead were built from the ground up for computers, Crisis 2 hoped to reach a larger audience by expanding its reach to the current generation of consoles. To better accommodate controllers, aspects of the gameplay were streamlined, causing a split in the fandom. Some believe the adoption of consoles was Crytek's response to the massive piracy the original game encountered, or was a result of their publisher EA forcing their hand. But in interviews with game director and at the time president of Crytek, Zavat Yarli, he states it was in fact the result of the influence from friends and family of Crytek developers who were primarily playing on consoles. Now with the Xbox 360 and PS3 as target platforms, CryEngine had to be optimized to take full advantage of the consoles. This meant squeezing every last drop of performance they could from the hardware, resulting in an increased multi-threaded performance for the third generation of CryEngine, which also paid dividends to PC gamers. Due to the re-architecture of CryEngine, Crisis 2 became a significant investment for the company. However, it was worthwhile as it would allow for easier development of future titles. Despite expanding the reach of the franchise to consoles and adopting a gameplay style that would theoretically appeal to a larger audience, Crisis 2 sold 3 million units, the same amount as its PC-locked older brother. Although the gameplay was streamlined and levels were more linear, Crisis 2 didn't throw away all aspects of its predecessor and attempted to assure players that play-how-you-like DNA was still retained here. Like before, the tool at the center of this gameplay design is the Nano Suit. Just as the series evolved, so too did the Nano Suit, with the Nano Suit 2.0. According to the lore, the second generation suit is a vast technical upgrade over the one seen in the first game, but only one 2.0 suit exists. Initially, this new suit was given to Prophet. However, after contracting the Ceph virus that was ravaging Manhattan, he was forced to shed the suit and give it to our silent protagonist, Alcatraz. Welcome to the future, son. Welcome to the war.
While the first generation nano suit felt a bit like biomechanical anime power armor, this evolution of it straight up is. More organic than ever, the suit integrates with the user deeper than previously thought possible. If you're familiar with the manga Berserk, which is my favorite fictional property, you're likely aware of the Berserker armor. While adorned in this armor, it addresses any serious wounds sustained by its wearer by growing further into them. The new nano suit works in a similar fashion and becomes nigh inseparable from its operator. The healing factor is such that it can keep a dead man walking, which is a consistent theme throughout the game. You turned them into dead men walking! I turned them into post-human warriors. You're a soldier. Think of it as necessary sacrifice. You lied to us! We are all dead men walking. Not only is the suit able to keep the often fatally wounded Alcatraz going, but it can also assimilate its operator and become one with them. Although Prophet was able to remove the suit and sever his connection to it via a lead injection, it was unable to forget its original operator, and throughout the course of the game, the suit inherits more and more of his personality. Wake up, Marine. This is no time for dying. Get your ass back in the fight. And by the time Crisis 3 starts, the suit had completely overridden Alcatraz's personality. They call me. Profit. In terms of gameplay, when compared to Nano Suit 1, we get a streamlined control system here. You have to keep in mind, with the game now shipping on consoles as well, it had to feel great to play on controllers too. I have tried playing the first Crisis with controller and the classic suit mode navigation, but it just feels awkward and clumsy. The radial menu that let you control your suit is still retained here, but I rarely used it. Instead, I almost exclusively used the pre-programmed hotkeys to invoke all the suit's functionality. Despite preferring all the precise control the original system gave you, there is a quality I like here about pressing a button and instantly switching modes. The experience is more seamless, which is probably how you'd want the suit to act in real life where you can just think of a mode and switch into it instantly rather than bringing up a menu first. The alterations to suit mechanics don't end here though. Speed and strength have now been combined into a singular power mode, which is not an explicit mode that can be switched into like its ancestors. Now the mode automatically activates when performing specific actions. One of the most notable changes in this regard is that any form of sprinting is now considered an invocation of power mode and thus drains energy. Super jumping, powered up throws, and stronger melee attacks can also still be accessed, but are now executed by simply holding down their input button. Ah! Beyond that, the mode retains its ability to reduce scoped weapon sway and negate recoil from firearms by holding down on the sprint input while aiming down sights or firing a weapon. By detaching power mode from a singular mode players must switch into, it can now be used in conjunction with any other nano suit ability. This also means you can't switch into speed mode and move faster without the expenditure of energy. I will defend this change a bit by pointing out that levels are less expansive and instead more packed with combat leading to a distinct speed mode being less necessary. There is further changes to mobility with the complete removal of going prone. There is no direct alternative to getting this low, however players can now combat slide and climb over ledges, which is a feature I wish the first game had. All these changes serve to push the player forward faster and speed up the overall feel of combat. In terms of mobility, Crisis 2 was also a bit ahead of its time by featuring both combat sliding and mantling, as they're seen in most all military FPS games today. Looking at the other big shooters of the era like Halo Reach and Modern Warfare 3, it appears one or neither of these mechanics is present. Returning to the nano suits modes, in the first game, the player was always forced to remain in one of them. Now by default, the suit has no functionality enabled, and any use of a mode will drain the nano suit's energy reserves. Armor mode returns, but functionality is different than before, as it constantly drains energy from the user, as well as sapping more when taking incoming fire. During my playthrough of Crisis 2 on Veteran, the same difficulty I played the first on, I did feel noticeably tankier this time around. Cloak mode also makes its return, but in comparison, it hasn't changed much. While cloaked, most combat actions will completely drain the user's energy, however certain weapons like the pistol can actually be used from stealth without depleting the player's energy reserves. I actually didn't know this through my whole first playthrough, and it was only when I was testing something out, specifically for recording this clip, that I found out the pistol acts this way. Still, for almost every other gun, when you're cloaked you want to decloak right before you shoot so that way you don't drain all your energy, then once you're done you can cloak back up. The new stealth takedowns pay nice attention to detail in this regard, as they automatically decloak then recloak the player while they dispatch an enemy. The nano suit also provides two other functions which are related to its visor in the form of nanovision and binoculars. Nanovision is simply thermal vision, 
and replaces the night vision from the first game. I find nano vision much more useful than its predecessor as it lets me quickly visually parse environments for enemies. This new function is just as useful in hectic situations as it is during the night. When it comes to the binoculars, they function much the same and I'll talk about them more in depth when discussing the tactical options the game presents players with. Despite the suit controls of the Nano Suit 2.0 being streamlined, the game compensates by adding depth in the form of suit progression, which fits the play how you like identity of the series. Suit progression exists in the form of four categories of upgrades, each targeted at a specific function of the suit. Within each category, Four modules can be unlocked, but only one module per category can be equipped at a time. Many of the suit's modules are relatively mundane passive upgrades, such as increasing the duration players can stay cloaked or maintain armor mode. They certainly let players tune the nano suit to fit their playstyle more, but there's nothing too extravagant here, with the wildest option being something like a ground pound. To unlock modules, a material known as Nano Catalyst must be acquired by slaying Seth. You'll face countless Seth during the duration of the story, so you really shouldn't have any issue unlocking modules that interest you. Despite lacking a proper New Game Plus mode, the game adds replayability by having players retain all their unlocked suit modules, Nano Catalyst, and weapon upgrades when replaying levels, which can make it fun to replay an earlier level a different way. I always appreciate the addition of a good progression system, but things aren't perfect here. If you want to play in pure stealth and avoid combat when possible, you'll miss out on a significant amount of Nano Catalyst. The material only drops when Seth are killed, so avoiding conflict with them also means avoiding upgrades. Additionally, when Seth are slain, a cloud of Nano Catalyst spawns over their corpses and players must walk over it to pick it up. This becomes a bit of an annoyance if you love sniping, as it forces you to run around and loot the corpses of your enemies like you're playing Kill Confirmed in Call of Duty. Kill Confirmed. My final grievance with progression is it doesn't let you examine the descriptions of modules you can't afford yet. This is irritating as it forces players to either go online and search for these descriptions or just wait and stack up enough of the nano catalyst to see if the next upgrade down the line interests them. From a story standpoint, the upgrade system is interesting as the suit is assimilating foreign DNA and using it to evolve even further. This evolution is also defined by the way its operator uses the suit, making it feel intelligent and natural. Fighting Seth for genetic material and using it to evolve did give me shades of Bioshock, where you'd also have to fight specific enemies to earn the genetic currency Adam to upgrade your character. I think many players will appreciate the addition of a progression system here, but the suit modules almost feel like multiplayer perks and after doing a bit of research, it appears most of them are also present there. Multiplayer narrowed the available categories from 4 down to 3, but each has more variety than seen in the campaign. I really would have loved to see some of these extra modules added back into the campaign, as they would have worked well as passive upgrades that are always enabled. Giving players more things to unlock is always fun, and it would have helped further the feeling of the nanosuit evolving throughout the course of the game. To visually separate the next generation nanosuit from the original, the suit was given an aesthetic overhaul. The design language of the new suit better fits Crisis 2's more action-focused combat and true purpose of the nanosuit. In the cover art of Crisis 2, the nanosuit 2.0 is posed in such a way that it recreates the pose of the nanosuit in the cover for the original. Initially, I wasn't sure how I felt about the design of nanosuit 2.0. I love the original, but over time I've come to prefer the second generation. The original suit is slimmer and ornamented with tactical bags, which meshes well with the gameplay design of the first Crisis. Nanosuit 2.0 looks like it was modeled after a goddamn bodybuilder. The semi-organic musculature of the suit is nearly bursting out of its frame. Look at the size of the suit's traps, they're huge and completely consume its neck. The new suit also takes a design cue from Halo, where Master Chief's second set of armor dropped the tactical bags. The removal of these accessories aids in creating a sleeker silhouette, but it does make you wonder where Alcatraz stores his ammunition. Additionally, the higher contrast of the suit makes it more visually appealing to me, and I absolutely love the yellow accents it features. Overall, the suit feels more organic and better represents what the actual human physiology underneath looks like. The nano suit isn't the only tool available for players to define their experience with. Weapon customization returns, and guns can still be altered at any point during the game. Unfortunately, most weapons now feature fewer attachments and points of customization than before. One of the main areas I noticed this reduction of customization was in the assault rifles. In the first crisis, the most common assault rifle, the FY-71, offered an expansive list of options across its five potential points of customization. In the sequel, assault rifles are still the most flexible weapons, but the majority have narrowed their points of customization down to three or less. Still, you can tune your weapons quite effectively for different situations, and the addition of clear weapon stats is a nice bonus. 
Alternative firing modes are also still around, but have now been integrated into the weapon attachment system, meaning you can either switch your gun between automatic and semi-automatic, or just leave it fully auto and attach a grenade launcher instead. I think I know which option most people would pick. There are also some weapon features I enjoyed that are altered for the worse or completely lost here. The tactical sleeping dart attachment is now absent, meaning all takedowns are now lethal. Shotguns no longer offer an alternative firing mode, meaning you can't pick between a wide or narrow pellet spread. Pistols can't be dual wielded and have also lost their burst fire functionality, and I find laser pointers to be far inferior to how they functioned in the first entry. In Crisis, I put laser pointers on almost all my guns. They offered pinpoint accuracy when shooting from the hip, and I could pair this up with a scope, allowing me to be effective up close and at range. Laser pointers now inhabit the same slot of sights and scopes, forcing you to pick one or the other. The dot at the end of the laser pointer is also less visible, causing it to appear like it's just pointing off into oblivion. Overall, I found it harder to aim with and almost never used it. One thing that didn't really change was acquiring new weapon upgrades. Players simply need to pick up a weapon featuring attachments, and from that point forward, those specific attachments become available on all compatible guns. Even though I do find the reduction in weapon customization disappointing, I do enjoy the selection of weapons available this time around. Weapons are separated into one of three classifications. There's normal guns, whose ammo can be resupplied at any of the numerous ammo caches around the game, power weapons, which occupy the same slots as normal guns, yet ammo for them is scarce and cannot be picked up from caches. There's also a couple of super powerful weapons that don't occupy an inventory slot, but once you run out of ammo with them, you have to throw them away. Lastly, there's explosives, with players able to hold a rocket launcher, C4, and grenades simultaneously. The game still has you feeling like a walking arsenal, although pistols no longer inhabit a unique space in players' inventories, and instead must occupy one of the two main weapon slots. Furthermore, players can't just switch to just their fists anymore and go into power mode and punch their way through encounters like in the past. All in all, there is a greater variety of weapons to pick from this time around. Most classifications of firearm now offer more than one weapon. There's also some pretty unique guns, like the K-Volt, an SMG that fires small electrified pellets, and the X-43 Mike, a microwave emitter that cooks enemies and is devastating against the Ceph. Ammunition for normal weapons is plentiful and found at ammo caches, which are located everywhere. In more expansive areas of a level, they might also be directly pointed out to the player and be considered a tactical option. While traversing through a mission, the player will occasionally be alerted by the nanosuit that there are tactical options available. Tactical options available. These tactical options serve as points of interest the player may want to investigate and are typically made available when entering a larger area. I'll refer to these areas as tactical combat zones, as they generally highlight a few approaches players can take to fight their way to the exit with. Tactical options range from the ammunition caches I discussed earlier, to sewage pipes that allow players to sneak their way through an entire encounter. I appreciate what they were going for here, but several of these zones offer just two tactical options, with one of the options just pointing players towards the exit. While the system is designed to encourage the play how you like style, in some ways, it reduces player freedom. Highlighting all these points of interest forces the player's gaze towards them, thus removing the rewarding feeling you'd have organically stumbling upon a special weapon or using a strategically advantageous point. These tactical combat zones are the widest areas to fight enemies in in Crisis 2, but by no means are they as large as the sandbox in Crisis 1. For what Crisis 2 does in narrowing the scope of levels, it partially makes up for with a vastly increased sense of verticality. Of course, in an urban environment, you'd hope the developers would take advantage of all the large buildings around, and I do feel Crytek did a good job in this regard. Buildings frequently offer multiple floors to explore and are often surrounded by scaffolding. This increased verticality does make for more interesting combat scenarios. It's also clearly responsible for the addition of the ledge grabbing mechanic and pairs well with the game's cover system. Crisis 1 featured a manual leading system with Q &E, which isn't exactly uncommon in PC-centric FPS games, but I haven't played many multi-platform first-person shooters that incorporate this. With Crisis 2, gone are the days of manually leaning around corners, as it's been replaced by a new, context-sensitive system. Now when you hide behind cover, an arrow will appear alerting the player they can aim down their sights to pop up from behind it. This is a fairly novel approach to cover, and I haven't really experienced it in another first-person shooter. While aiming from behind cover, players are locked onto it, but can still move around and can even press forward to lean out for further over it. It does remind me a bit of Gears of War, but brought into first person, however it's not a perfect system, as the context sensitivity didn't always work when it should. I do like this system quite a bit, and it's faster than what you'd see in the newer Call of Duty games, where you can mount your weapon on the edge of geometry. It's also very immersive, peeking over cover to pop a few shots off, then ducking back down and seeing holes get blown through the top of it. This brings me to the physics and destruction seen in Crisis 2, and in short, it's pared back from the first game. There are aspects of this that make sense. The Lingshan Islands from Crisis 1 were full of shanties that you could blow over like the Big Bad Wolf, 
In contrast, New York is full of towering brick and mortar buildings. Blowing these buildings up in a dynamic sense would have been far more demanding, and Crytek obviously had to keep the relatively constrained CPUs of consoles in mind when it comes to simulation. While there are far less trees in Crisis 2, the ones you can see here can no longer be cut in half, which is a bit sad because I know so many people who just like me were blown away that you could cut trees into tiny little pieces in the first game. Like the shift from a living jungle to a concrete one, the world in Crisis 2 just feels less alive and reactive to players' actions. Now the extent of destruction is really just chipping away at cover, even wooden crates don't fully break apart anymore and you can just pop a few holes into them. On the other hand, scripted destruction is much larger and extravagant than ever before, but it doesn't really affect the gameplay in any significant way. On the topic of gameplay, another aspect of the original game that offered more depth was the difficulty system. As players progressed through the difficulty levels, the game would not only become harder, but it also made the game more realistic by removing elements of the heads-up display and having enemies speak entirely in Korean. In comparison, difficulty in Crisis 2 is very straightforward. The higher the difficulty level is, the more damage enemies do and the more damage they can take. Throughout the entirety of this gameplay section, I've drawn many comparisons to the first entry and it's just hard not to. So many aspects of the game's design changed and became more in line with the industry standard, and I'm not saying I entirely hate it. The moment-to-moment -moment shooting does feel tighter, and the increased sense of verticality makes for more interesting combat encounters. Still, something was lost along the way with all these changes, and it took away from what many loved about Crisis. Even Crytek took the feedback into account, and Savat Yarly said in hindsight, moving Crisis 2 setting to New York was probably a mistake. Like most people, I never read the Crisis comics before jumping into Crisis 2, but they do provide some information that helps set up the sequel. Some important bits to know are that Nomad and Helena Rosenthal are killed during an encounter with the CIA who are investigating the island and Prophet. The comics also reveal more information about Prophet, who is working with Jacob Hargreave, president of Crynet and a major character in Crisis 2. Prophet owed Hargreave for bailing him out of a difficult situation in the past, and as a result, he led the field test of the nanosuit against the Ceph. In fact, the nanosuits are developed using Ceph technology, which is the reason they're so interested in Raptor Team from the moment they reach the island. While the comic gives more insight into the characters and the Ceph, it doesn't give any specific details on why the Ceph went from looking like tentacled alien freezing monsters to what looks like live-action Megatron combined with a jellyfish. The Ceph didn't just receive a visual overhaul, they also changed their method of warfare. In Crisis 2, the Ceph are no longer interested in freezing the planet and making it more hospitable for them. This time around, they're in the business of bio-warfare and utilize an engineered virus known as the Manhattan Virus. This virus earned its namesake from the location it was unleashed upon, and its effects on humans are devastating, as it ultimately turns its victims into an amalgam of flesh and bones. Oh, Jesus. That's human tissue. It's people. People just melted down. Not even Prophet, clad in the nanosuit 2.0, was safe from the virus, as he ended up contracting it, which forced him to give the nanosuit to Alcatraz. From a gameplay standpoint, the Ceph now remind me of the hunters from Halo. They're covered in durable metal, but gaps in their armor reveal their true gelatinous bodies, which are very weak to gunfire. Most of their backs are also completely exposed, making attacks from the rear quite lethal. Fighting the Ceph feels completely different than before, where they typically fly above and shoot down at the player. Here, Ceph more closely mirror human soldiers wearing exosuits, and have several classifications and even full-blown mechs. Fighting against this iteration of the Ceph is fine, and they're more prominently featured throughout the campaign, but by the three-quarter mark of the game, I started to grow a bit fatigued from fighting them, as each cluster is quite similar to one another. Normally, a group of Ceph is filled with grunts, which are the equivalent of basic infantrymen and stalkers, who run around the battlefield flushing enemies out of cover with their blades. There is also a command variant of each of these two types, which are a bit harder to fight in battle and drop more nano catalyst for the player. Outside that, there's heavy troopers and occasional boss battles with a pinger or a gunship. These heavy enemies hit hard, but the AI in the game isn't particularly intelligent and it's easy enough to sneak up on enemies and just strap them full of C4. I'm also not sure if it was by design or by coincidence that the grunts often expose their backs to the players when they're taking cover. Grunts are quite tall, so hiding behind low cover doesn't completely conceal them, and it makes shooting their back, their vulnerable spot, very easy. I've definitely heard some Crisis fans that don't like the design change in the Ceph, but in the first Crisis, as soon as the Ceph entered the game, a stealthy approach became much less appealing. The Ceph were more durable and could no longer be dropped with a single silenced headshot, and instead the game focused on action more and the use of heavy weaponry. By taking most 
all stuff out of the air and placing them back on the ground, Crisis 2 made stealth more viable against them, as the new stealth takedowns could be used against the lesser Ceph. Overall, Ceph are more prominently featured in combat throughout the entirety of Crisis 2, and are interwoven better with Cell, the enemy human faction. This helps a bit in keeping combat from getting too stale, as fighting either group for too long becomes tiresome. In the first Crisis, I found the mystery around the Ceph and what exactly was occurring on the Lingshan Islands to be the plot element that drove me through the story. With Ceph as a bit more of a known quantity in Crisis 2, the story focuses more on the Nanosuit 2.0 and Crynet. Crisis 2 takes place in 2023, which is the same year this video was made in. This time around, players inhabit the completely silent protagonist Alcatraz. The game opens with Alcatraz and his fellow Marines arriving in New York City to defend Nathan Gould, an ex Crynet employee with knowledge pertinent to stopping the Ceph. This opening mirrors the first games, as we arrive with a team in a vehicle, but this time underwater, instead of in the clouds. In both cases, shit hits the fan almost immediately, as here Alcatraz and his friends are jumped by the Ceph, who wipe out nearly everyone. Prophet shows up to the party a bit late, and all he's left with is a dying Alcatraz. With no other option, Prophet drags Alcatraz to safety, where he transplants the nanosuit onto our playable character. There are some questions I have about this encounter. As I previously discussed, Prophet was infected with a Manhattan virus, but throughout the entirety of the game, Alcatraz never contracts it. Now, the ultimate goal of Crisis 2 is curing this Manhattan virus. I'm assuming the virus didn't have enough time to infect Alcatraz before the suit could come up with countermeasures to combat it. And perhaps since the suit's previous wearer already had the virus, it was a bit more resistant to it. My other question is how Prophet can even remove the Nanosuit 2.0 without immediately dying. As I previously discussed, Nanosuit 2.0 is integrated with the user on a deep physical level. There's some speculation that the undersuit Prophet was wearing kept the Nanosuit 2.0 from completely merging with him. In Alcatraz's case, there's no way he can take the suit off and survive. Regardless, with the new Nanosuit in Alcatraz's possession, it begins to instruct him on how to operate it, which flows organically into the gameplay tutorials. Unaware of the suit swap, Nathan Gould contacts who he assumes is Prophet and informs him of his current whereabouts. I'm outside the evac center. You have to get here. I don't know how long I can hold out. As Alcatraz fights his way through Manhattan and gets familiar with the nano suit, he picks up on some interesting information that Krynet's private military force, Cell, fears Prophet is propagating the Manhattan virus. It's at this point that Cell Commander and typical military hard ass Dominic Lockhart issues a kill on site order for both Prophet and any infected civilian. This is Commander Lockhart, Lockhart. all cell personnel. Despite all medical attempts to reverse the effects of the cellular breakdown in the infected, we have, we have no viable cure. Evacuation is no longer an option. A shoot to kill discretion is now visited citywide to be exercised upon any suspicion of infection. Further to this, nano suit subject, Prophet, is also designated as an active biohazard. Prophet, Prophet is to be shot on site. So on route to Gould, Alcatraz acquires an alien tissue sample, which allows for upgrading the nano suit and begins its analysis of the foreign DNA. Further along the way, Alcatraz stumbles across two major cell operatives in a heated argument, Commander Lockhart and Tara Strickland, the daughter of Major Strickland from the First Crisis. The two are at odds when it comes to Alcatraz's fate. Lockhart is just the stereotypical military bad guy who can't be reasoned with and just wants revenge for his dead troops. Terra, on the other hand, works closely with Krynet's president, Jacob Hargreave, and warns Lockhart that Hargreave wants Prophet alive and with the nanosuit. Shortly after this, Gould makes an escape from his lab and asks Alcatraz to destroy his computers there. Alcatraz complies and fulfills a request on his final approach to Gould's new hiding spot. Now finally face to face with Gould, the man spends little time catching up before he sits Alcatraz down into a nanosuit cradle, where he begins to pull up information on the Ceph tissue sample the player collected. At this moment, Gould discovers Prophet is no longer the one within the suit. Fortunately, buried within the suit's memories is Prophet's final goodbye, which leaves Gould in disbelief. With no better alternative, Gould places his trust in Alcatraz, just as Prophet did before, and debriefs him on what he's learned from the scan. Since acquiring the Ceph DNA, the nanosuit has been hard at work formulating something new, which Gould speculates is some sort of vaccine. Currently, Gould doesn't have enough processing power to pull that data out of the suit, and he believes the only place capable of that would be in Hargreaves' lab. Before the two have any more time to plan, they're interrupted by sniper fire from cell operatives, forcing them to part ways for the time being. Just as Alcatraz makes his escape from the apartment building, Gould informs him cell has a command post in Wall Street that should be able to run the deep layer scan they need. The pair find their way into the facility and run the scan, which reveals just how deeply the nanosuit has integrated with Alcatraz. That trauma to hunt both lungs. Looks like the right ventricle took most of the damage there. On 
Wings ruptured at multiple locations. Hate broken ribs at. I'll take your pick. Third, fourth, third, fifth. Got a flail chest. Flail pigment right there. Extensive pulmonary bruising. Ing. Morbid. trauma to the sternum. The thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. He's a corpse walking ghoul. Without the stop. Look at that. It's like it's growing into the wounds. Before Gould can extract the vaccine data, Commander Lockhart shows back up to kill who he believes is Prophet. For being so cautious of the potential biohazard risk Prophet poses, Lockhart sure doesn't mind getting up close and personal with him. Before the commander can put Alcatraz down, Tara Strickland arrives and forces him to stand down so Alcatraz can be taken into custody and delivered to Hargreave. As the cell operatives escort Gould and Alcatraz out of their facility, Gould lets it slip that Prophet is no longer operating his suit. Terra takes Gould, while Lockhart places Alcatraz on a separate helicopter for extraction. However, this captivity doesn't last long as a giant mechanical tendril bursts forth from the earth, knocking the helicopter out of the sky. Alcatraz has little time to react before he's stricken by a wave of spores and Seth troops, which render him unconscious. During this time, more of Prophet's memories become available to Alcatraz, and the nanosuit's analysis of the virus continues. As Alcatraz comes back to, He's greeted by a call from Jacob Hargreave, who works hard to earn the player's trust. All right, I'm getting a limited feed from your suit, son, but now it'll have to do. I don't believe we've been introduced. Jack Hargreave, at your service. I don't doubt that Jason Gould will have mentioned my name, but I'm bound to assume he didn't have much good to say about me. But we have other, other, more pressing concerns right now. We have to get you weaponized as to speed. With Hargreaves' guidance, Alcatraz makes his way to Seth's spire, which emits the Manhattan virus. Here, Alcatraz attempts to enter the spire to sabotage it. The spire rejects Alcatraz, and before he has any time to try again, Hargreaves warns him to escape now as the Pentagon dispatched bombers that will flood that district of New York. Unable to escape the flood waters, Alcatraz is washed away to his fellow Marine Chino, who somehow survived the attack on the submarines at the beginning of the game. Alcatraz works with his fellow Marines in aiding civilians evacuation from the city via the subway system. After helping the Marines, they return the favor and assist Alcatraz in getting to the Hargreave Rash building where the nanosuit can be upgraded to better interface with Ceph technology. Before Alcatraz is able to receive the upgrade, a Ceph mech called a pinger causes the building to flood, leading Alcatraz to rendezvous with Chino and the other Marines. From here, Colonel Barclay takes control of the troops and has them regroup at Grand Central Station, where players run back into Nathan Gould. Gould claims he was able to escape from Strickland and pushes for sending Alcatraz to meet with Jacob Hargreave, as he believes Hargreave holds all the answers. Barclay is more concerned with saving as many civilians as possible and places Gould on the train for evac prior to sending Alcatraz and the other Marines back above ground to hold off the Ceph. After fending the Ceph off long enough for the trains to depart, a secondary extraction point is created at Times Square, which is overrun by the invaders. Alcatraz locates the spire in Times Square just in time for the nanosuit to finish processing the alien virus, which allows him to hijack the spore emitter, neutralizing its effects against humans, and turning it back on the Ceph. With this discovery, Gould, whose evac train was blocked in Harlem, presses Barclay and states they must must get Alcatraz to the Crynet complex known as the Prism, so he can meet Hargrave face to face. The Marines assist by dropping Alcatraz off at Roosevelt Island, where he cuts his way through the self forces and finally dispatches Commander Lockhart. Just as Alcatraz is about to meet with Hargreave, the old man betrays him, which didn't really come as a surprise. Hargreave's true intention was always to wear the suit himself, and he has his team try and skin the suit from Alcatraz. Unfortunately for Hargreave, by this point, the suit had completely merged with Alcatraz, making any prospect of removal impossible. Tara Strickland arrives and saves Alcatraz once again and divulges she's been working undercover for the CIA the whole time, and was the one responsible for sending Prophet reinforcements. Strickland encourages players to confront Hargreave, as he is the world's foremost expert on the Ceph. Upon arrival at Hargreave's office, he reveals the true nature of his existence as a piece of floating jerky in a vat of liquid. I know the nanosuit's helium factor is incredible, but putting this overaged piece of meat into it and expecting him to save the world seems like a bit of a stretch. From the initial call with Hargreave, I was expecting some sort of twist like this. The man's around 127 at this point, and I actually expected him to just be a brain in a jar, but this is pretty close. 
Hargreave upgrades the nano suit for a final time and tells Alcatraz to continue humanity's struggle for survival just as he accepts his fate and begins the self-destruction countdown for his facility. Alcatraz escapes the destruction and is carried by the waters back to the shores of Manhattan, where he reunites with Chino, Gould, and Strickland. The good vibes don't last long, as Colonel Barkley notifies the squad the Department of Defense approved a tactical nuclear strike on New York City. Apparently, the DoD didn't learn their last nuclear strike at the end of the first crisis just made the Ceph even stronger. Things only get worse as the squad convinces Barkley to buy them some time, but mechanical Ceph tendrils sprout from the ground and carry Central Park into the sky, where a gargantuan spire is primed to unleash the virus over an even larger area. Alcatraz is dropped off at the newly formed Sky Island and makes his final assault against the Ceph, where he's successful in entering the spire. With Hargreaves' final upgrade, the nanosuit can once again repurpose the viral spore against the Ceph, and as the spire fires, it cleanses the Manhattan virus from the city and wipes out all remaining Ceph. This process takes a toll on Alcatraz, but as he stumbles from the wreckage of the spire, he begins picking up news that Ceph machinery is unearthing itself around the globe. The game ends with Jacob Hargreaves' counterpart, Carl Ernest Roche, contacting Alcatraz and asking who exactly he is. Alcatraz, now one with Prophet's memories, fully adopts his identity and announces, They called him Prophet. The story of Crisis 2 is certainly more bombastic than that seen in the previous games. However, the Crisis series has a bit of a problem carrying characters forward, as many of the ones established in Crisis 2 aren't seen in the trilogy's finale, which makes it harder to care for them in the long run. Jacob Hargreave was a standout character for me and gave me elusive man vibes of someone who knows too much and has the charisma to smooth talk others into their bidding. I enjoyed playing back through the campaign for this video and replaying most of the levels in the remaster, but even with the addition of suit progression, the experience feels less replayable than the campaign offered in the first Crisis. Over the years, there's been several versions of Crisis 2 that have released, and I think it's worth spending a few minutes to go over them here. The primary version I played for this video is Crisis 2 Maximum Edition. The Maximum Edition was released about a year after the game's initial launch and replaced the original version of the game. So if you're browsing storefronts now, you'll only see this version. The Maximum Edition was mostly focused on multiplayer content, but it does bundle in some patches to the game that you'd otherwise have to install manually. If you're like me and bought Crisis 2 when it first launched, you'll probably also have the original version of the game in your Steam library, which you can still play that way too. But like I just mentioned, you'll have to update it manually if you want it to be on par with the Maximum Edition. Of course I also need to talk about the console release. I never owned Crisis 2 on the console till recently, where I picked it up at a retro game store, but the experience is not great here. The footage you're seeing here was captured directly from Xbox 360, and the frame rate is very inconsistent and does not hold to a steady 30fps. A controller is more forgiving when it comes to frame rates like these, but this experience is far from ideal. Lastly, there's the remastered version of Crisis 2. This remastered remaster doesn't go as far as the original Crisis remaster does, however in that case, that remaster used the Xbox 360 and PS3 version to upgrade the game. As Crisis 2 was already built with CryEngine 3, the upgrade process seems to have been more straightforward. For me, the best improvements were the increased texture quality, in-game access to FOV modification, and the ray trace lighting, which makes scenes look far more natural. The game can actually look quite stunning with this improved lighting and more realistic materials. I understand the original version of Crisis 2 going for that heavy contrast with a blue undertone, yet it's a product of the era. This more natural lighting looks far better in comparison, and I find it less harsh on the eyes. Due to the larger changes with the first Crisis and its remaster, I can understand why some people would want to play the original version. In the case of Crisis 2 though, I would just stick to playing the remaster of the game. Lastly, I wanted to touch a bit on the performance of both the original release and of the remaster version. I'm rocking top of the line hardware here with a 7950X 3D and RTX 4090, and for both the remaster and the original, I had no problem playing at 4K 120fps with all settings maxed out. Now for the remaster, I did keep the game on DLSS balanced as I was recording every second of gameplay locally with OBS and also had ray tracing maxed out. So both versions performed better than Crisis and Crisis Remastered where I really struggled to touch 120 frames per second on either version. Both of those games seem to have more CPU simulation going on and as a result are more brutally limited by single threaded CPU performance. At the ends of my videos, I always like to rank my games and Crisis 2 lands in the beat here. It's fun romping through the action-packed campaign, yet it's undeniable the game lacks the same staying power the first Crisis had. I'd love to hear how you feel about Crisis 2 in the comments down below, as it's clear there's split opinions on the title. If you want more content from me, I'd love it if you hit the subscribe button, as it really helps the channel grow. Other than that, check out my retrospective of the first Crisis, and have a great day.